With 12 regional reserve banks, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. Each bank gives an individualized perspective of the economy and the economic activity across the country and is able to recognize the needs of its particular region. The community development programs of the Federal Reserve promote access to financial markets, identify the needs of underserved communities, conducts research, and identifies emerging issues. So how can the Federal Reserve help low and moderate communities like those in the San Joaquin Valley, especially hard hit during the Great Recession? We'll talk with Leilani Barnett, Regional Manager for Community Development of the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. The Federal Reserve does community development? Who knew? Additional funding for the Matty Report made possible by a grant from Paramount Agricultural Companies, growing healthy food for you and your family. From the California Channel at the State Capitol, Valley PBS, and the Maddie Institute, it's the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Welcome. Today we're coming from the Valley PBS studios in Fresno. The Federal Reserve is regularly in the news on issues of national significance, but most would probably be surprised to learn that the Fed is also engaged at the local level, doing community development work. What are the Federal Reserve's community development programs and how do they impact local communities? Our guest is Leilani Barnett, the Regional Manager of Community Development at the Re Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. Welcome to the Matty Report. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So usually when we hear about the Federal Reserve, it's in relation to interest rates or regulating banks or the economy, it's national, not local uh, issues. Why is the Federal Reserve involved in community development? Well, our Community Development Department originated from the Community Reinvestment Act, CRA, mm -hmm. which was a response to redlining. And redlining was a practice by which banks and financial institution, um, prior to the uh, enactment of the CRA in 1977, categorically exempted certain neighborhoods from um, their investments. So they would literally draw big red uh, circles on maps and say we're not we're not going to invest in that neighborhood and and it didn't have to do with assessing the risk of a particular applicant it was just an all-out um, exemption from extending credit to those neighborhoods so if that's a poor neighborhood it's going to become more more poor exactly um, so how does the community reinvestment act the CRA that you referred to how does it work so the three agencies in our country that regulate the banks um, examine banks annually to see that they are investing in the low-income neighborhoods that are within their districts. And uh, the three agencies are the Federal Reserve, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, OCC, and the FDIC. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we make sure that they're not categorically ex excluding those neighborhoods. Now, it doesn't say that they have to uh, make any investment. They do have to take risk into consideration, and it has to make business sense, but they just can't exclude an entire area. So it's kind of a good faith effort to do some loaning in, in that area, not an absolute exclusion. Right. Well, what are the, what's the enforcement if they're not, if you're finding they're acting in bad faith, they so, are redlining? So there are um, uh, measures and uh, they, they each bank gets a, um, a certain ranking based on the extent to which they are investing in low and moderate income neighborhoods and there can be um, serious regulatory actions against them if they don't meet those requirements. Okay, so you're with the San Francisco Reserve Bank. There, we mm -hmm. talked about you know, 12 different reserve banks. You're with San Francisco. What's the geographic reach of the San Francisco Re Reserve Bank? So the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank covers the western uh, territory, the, the western states, including California, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Nevada, Hawaii, um, American Samoa, uh, uh, Guam, and a couple other states. So you probably like those trips to Hawaii when you've got to deal with issues over there. Exactly. I'm sure. Um, so uh, you're talking, we're going to talk about community development. First of all, what exactly does that mean? So initially, when our community development department started, we were really focusing on the CRA uh, requirements. But uh, since that time, we've begun looking much more holistically at the needs of low and moderate income communities, um, including issues around affordable housing, education, workforce development, healthy communities, family financial resiliency. We deal with uh, issues such as medical deserts, areas where families don't have access to health care. We deal with food deserts where people don't have access to fresh foods and, and groceries and, uh, and bank deserts as well. So you, you're now taking a much broader look. Um, when we talk about community development, it's more than just economic per se. It's, mm -hmm. it's all these other issues. And how do you tie them all together? What's your argument to tie all these things together? 
Well, when we, when we look at different regions, we see that many of these uh, issues overlap. If you look at a low-income neighborhood, uh, it often has low uh, educational attainment. It has poor health outcomes. It may not have uh, good access for its residents to grocery stores, medical uh, access, and, and the like. So um, what we see is that in the past decades, sometimes some of these efforts have been rather siloed. Maybe public health will work separately from community development but really the issues are, are integrated and it's important to take this holistic approach. Yeah, it's interesting because we've had uh, other programs on the Affordable Care Act and the question of whether or not providing health insurance is going to lead to healthier outcomes. And one of the arguments is, well, maybe not, because if you're living in a community that has a lot of air pollution or bad wa water quality or you're not exercising, it doesn't matter how good the doctor is, you're still going to be sick. Uh, so that's kind of the way you approach it, it sounds, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how does the Federal Reserve Bank choose which communities to work in? So uh, we really have it be community driven. So we don't come into a community and say, well, this is what we think you should do to improve your low and moderate income communities so much as have communities reach out to us. Um, we have government agencies of different departments reach out to us, sometimes regional community-based organizations, and they want to partner and see how can we work together to alleviate issues. Any examples of, of how you've done that in the past? So recently, the public health director of Tulare County, as an example, reached out and said, we have have an issue with food deserts. There's many areas in Tulare County where people aren't able to access fresh and healthy foods. So what we did was we looked at um, lots of different successful models of alleviating food deserts throughout the country. And we had a convening and invited a cross-sector group of people in Tulare, government folks, business. And you wanted to find food deserts just briefly? Food deserts are areas where uh, low and moderate income communities, they can't get to fresh and healthy foods. There, there are no grocery stores and maybe there's some corner markets, but they don't have um, produce. They don't have um, healthy foods to eat, so it's impacting people's health. So you're bringing best practices into Tulare County to show yeah. them how they can maybe alleviate that problem. Yes, and financial options as well for okay. investing. Okay, well up next, a closer look at the Federal Reserve Bank's community development work in the Central Valley. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're talking with Leilani Barnett, the Regional Manager of Community Development for the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. So I understand the Fed has a Community Development Research Division. Um, what are their areas of research and what are some of their findings? So we've really looked holistically at what are the best practices as far as what is working in community development. And uh, we recently published a book on this topic and it's available on our, our website for free but it, it really measures what the outcomes are of various efforts. And what we're seeing is the efforts that are very cross-sectoral, uh, that include academia, government, private sector, and nonprofit together, um, and include policy level work, as well as really systems level change, mm -hmm. um, are the ones that are most effective. Um, a, a lot of times in the last 30, 40 years, efforts around community development have been rather siloed, like the public health and community development example. Um, but the efforts that bring different institutions together around shared common goals are most effective, and those that really measure the outcomes and are data-driven. So uh, best practices, yeah. uh, which th then you can share with communities that, that need this assistance. Exactly. Okay. Um, now, the Fed also tries to bring community development capital into communities. What are some of the sources for community development capital? So there's really three main sources. Um, one is community development financial institutions, CDFIs, and those are like nonprofit banks. They get money at very low interest rates from the U.S. Treasury, and they and turn around and invest those in uh, ways that benefit communities. Um, some of the things they focus on are new community facilities. Uh, they, they finance new health clinics, especially in underserved areas. They finance um, fresh foods as far as refrigeration for convenience stores. So if a, a local bank isn't available, these uh, community development loan funds are, are established to take care of these problems? Well, and the banks invest in the CDFIs oh. as well for CRA credit. And so it's an easy way for Going the banks. Going back to that act again. That's right. Yeah. It's an easy way for the banks to meet their CRA requirements without taking on the risk directly because they invest through the CDFIs. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, well, let's talk about an area that's uh, 
been hard hit um, by uh, kind of a double whammy mm -hmm. by the housing crisis and the drought in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. um, what are the pressing concerns that you see existing in the Central Valley today? There's a lot of concerns in the Central Valley, certainly the high level of poverty. We have about 25% of folks in the Central Valley that are falling below the poverty line. And in part, that's because of the lower educational attainment levels. Um, not as many people graduating from college uh, struggle with high school graduation levels. Uh, we also have issues of chronic health, um, uh, poor air quality leading to high levels of asthma and other chronic health conditions that are really keeping people from going to work, from uh, be a being able to go to school and, and graduate. Yeah, so all this ties, and we're going to talk more about that later, but how it all ties in health issues tie into economic issues. But um, we're also seeing maybe some, let's be a little positive here, mm -hmm. about some emerging opportunities in the Valley. Um, what are some emerging opportunities that you're seeing in the Valley? There's some new um, state funds as well that are coming to fund community development efforts. Um, Prop 41, the VET housing bill, is going to provide $600 million in affordable housing for veterans and their families in the form of supportive housing and other affordable housing. And there's a lot of vets that are from the Central Valley. And that's specifically, that's a state fund. It is. It's a state, statewide. Yeah, what about cap and trade? Is there any money there? Absolutely. Within cap and trade, there's $130 million dollars that's going to be allocated for affordable housing and sustainable communities and uh, certainly cities that have transit will be eligible for those because that's really focused on greenhouse gas reductions and placing affordable housing where there's transit. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the problems obviously you were mentioning earlier is you know we have poor less educated communities like uh, the Central Valley. Uh, there's a proliferation of these uh, payday lenders in areas where there's no banks. Um, what is the, the Federal Reserve doing to promote financial literacy? So these the people yeah. aren't, aren't taken advantage, advantage right. by those folks. That's right. Well, it's interesting. Recently, the city of Fresno enacted a payday uh, ord ordinance that limited the uh, expansion of additional payday lenders. Um, what we've seen is that very traditionally under CRA, the, um, there's been efforts to do financial literacy, but that alone hasn't really changed people's behavior. If you go and tell somebody who's low or moderate income that they need uh, to save money, that's not necessarily going to happen. And so what we see is more effective is if you do the financial literacy and then at the same time you have an opt-in where a family can choose at that time to save a certain percentage of their funds towards something like a child savings account for college, mm -hmm. that that has much better results in actually achieving savings. And how, do you, how do you access that community though? I mean, you do it through what, through churches or through... Faith-based partnerships are very effective, um, and certainly um, community-based organizations that are providing other services to low-income families and, and partnering with those. Okay. Um, well, up next, uh, we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve's Healthy Communities Initiative. What does economic health have to do with physical health? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're talking with Lailani Barnett, the Regional Manager of Community Development for the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. So let's talk about the Federal Reserve uh, Bank's Healthy Communities Initiative. What's that all about? Well, um, it's a partnership with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it's really looking at how can public health and community development work more closely together, because what we see is that the U.S. spends more per capita on health care than any other country in the world. And yet, when we look at life expectancy, the U.S. is ranked 43rd. And yeah, my understanding in, in the numbers, I think we, we uh, per capita, are twice as high as the other, other industrialized countries. That's right. That we're, we're, what we're spending. So much more. And yet, uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes aren't matching up with that. And that's because only 10% of what impacts our health is related to health care. 60% is related to our behavior. And one thing that shapes our behavior is the, uh, the built environment around us. We're going to be more likely to exercise if there's bike lanes, if there's walking trails, yep. if there's sidewalks. I think you know how much I support walking trails, so I'm, I'm very attentive. Uh -huh. so, so you think those kinds of things though, in, in communities actually help? Absolutely. And, and they're critical. Um, as an example, in the Central Valley, a person's life expectancy varies by 21 years depending on which zip code they live in. 
And so a person's zip code is a better predictor of their health than their genetic code. Wow. And that also has to do with uh, access to uh, things like uh, fresh foods, access to jobs and transit to, to be able to get to work. And so you see, again, it's this holistic approach where you're looking yeah. at exercise, nutrition, and everything. Because if you don't have a healthy person, they can't get a job. They can't get a job. It hurts uh, the economy. Um, so just, I want to connect that for you. I, I don't want to mm -hmm. do that for you. Let, let me let, let you do it. How do you connect then health to the mission of the Federal Reserve Bank? Well, really, employers need a healthy workforce in order to succeed. And, uh, and health impacts the regional economy because it does impact high school graduation rates, college graduation rates, gross domestic product. So it's important on a regional and a national level. So, so going back to health, for example, uh, students who, who come, to work, come to school and they haven't had a good breakfast or something like that, they're not able to learn, mm -hmm. therefore they don't get an education, therefore they don't get employed. Right, and not only that, but we see that people that have graduated from college adopt much healthier behaviors. Um, so there's a real disparity between healthy behaviors in folks that don't make it through high school and college and folks that do. So in, in some ways, investing in college and education is a prescription for health, and uh, much the same way as, as investing in housing is a prescription for health. And let me just connect the, the characteristics of neighborhoods you were talking about. Could you give that a little more detail? What's specific characteristics are problematic uh, in, in certain neighborhoods. Yeah, so neighborhoods where there are no sidewalks, uh, you, you, can't, you can't walk around. Neighborhoods where people, families feel very unsafe, um, they're going to keep their kids indoors. Even if there is a park, no one's going to want to go to the park because they don't feel safe. Mm. Uh, neighborhoods without uh, bike lanes, uh, people aren't going to want to take that risk and um, and if there's high crime rate in particular then they're not going to want to go and uh, and bike. And then so. you also deal with the food deserts as well, health, getting access to healthy food. Um, mm -hmm. So there's also some discussion about how uh, your work in community development um, interacts with the Affordable Care Act. How, how do the right. two interact? So under the Affordable Care Act um, in California, and it does vary by state, but in, in California, nonprofit hospitals are required to provide community benefits now and uh, that meet community needs. And those community needs are determined by the process of completing a community health needs assessment. So under ACA, it's important that a wide range of stakeholders be involved in their hospital systems, community health needs assessments. Can you give me an idea what, what would be in that assessment? So um, there might be, for example, um, identification of asthma as a really big issue in the region. Um, and there are some upstream preventative ways to address asthma in, in the home uh, by alleviating dust mites um, and, and things like that. And ACA encourages a look at upstream interventions so that not as much is spent on health care. It's kind of a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, really, right. is, is the approach, it sounds like. Right. Um, so I've read some, some post-ACA uh, Affordable Care Act enactment that some hospitals are closing. Um, is that creating now medical deserts? Or we have food deserts? It is a challenge. There's been a number of hospitals that have closed, especially in rural areas. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of funding available for new federally qualified health clinics to be built, FQHCs. And those serve low-income folks primarily through Medicaid. And so these CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, have a lot of funds available to invest in the construction of new FQHCs. And so that should help, help alleviate that problem to some Absolutely. extent. Okay, when we, get, when we come back, we'll talk about the Federal Reserve's work in local communities to help small businesses and create more affordable housing. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're talking with Leilani Barnett, the Regional uh, Manager of Community Development for the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. So when people think of the Federal Reserve, they probably don't think about small business. Um, what does the Federal Reserve do to help small business? In the area of small business develop, um, development, we've worked a lot with banks because uh, oftentimes a small business might apply for a loan from a bank and get turned down. And that's an opportunity then for the bank to refer small businesses to a lot of the small businesses to many resources available to them that are free. So there's a... a is, is there a problem though with... Um well, some people would say that maybe we sh they, those small businesses shouldn't be getting uh, loans because they're financially risky. 
Um, yeah. is, is there, I mean, what's the argument to those people who kind of challenge that and say the government should stay out of being involved in this, let the banks, let the financial markets decide who to invest? With. Yeah, and, uh, and, and usually it is appropriate that the bank is rejecting that loan applicant. Um, they've determined it's, it's too risky, and usually the small business could benefit at that point from doing some more work on developing their business plan, for example, or getting some mentorship from somebody who has uh, already successfully grown a business. And, and there's things like the Small Business Development Centers provides uh, free technical assistance to small business owners to help them with um, developing their business plans. And there's a program uh, throughout the nation called SCORE that partners very experienced entrepreneurs with new small business owners. Yeah, I think that's really critical. A lot of businesses seem to, that fail, repeat the mistakes of others. And if they had just done a little more research, done a more thorough business plan or a marketing plan, they dramatically increase their chances of success. But there are a lot of resources available for entrepreneurs and small businesses. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of entrepreneurs probably feel, particularly with the web, feel overwhelmed. Um, so how do you focus them on the ones that are really important and not this information overload? Right. So um, CDFIs, again, are an, an opportunity for that because they provide micro loans. And uh, a lot of times the banks are focused on larger loan amounts. Um, but a small business, when they're just starting out, it might be more prudent for them to take out a, a very small loan. And so these CDFIs have funds uh, specifically aimed at doing that. Um, and then the Small Business Development Centers and SCORE are great resources. Well, one, of the, one of the other issues is, so even if you have a small business and you've got a good idea and you've got access to capital, you may not have access to a good workforce. Do you do anything to help develop a good workforce so that small business person has someone to hire? Yeah, and that's a really important issue. And uh, with workforce development, what we've seen is really focusing on education is worthwhile and an investment in education. Um, at, at what level? I mean, are you focusing on K through 12 or junior college, college, all the above? All of the above. There's a great model that uh, is going on now in Fresno, as an example, and it's focused on cradle to career at the time that the child is born, um, really getting that child ready to enter kindergarten by uh, focusing on quality preschool. And there's uh, CDFIs that are focused on investing specifically on kindergarten, uh, on preschools rather. Um, and so starting at that early age and then having a, a really cross-sector group working towards improving the educational outcomes. Um, the Fresno so Strive model is based off of a national model um, called Strive, and, and it looks at how businesses, the school system, government agencies, community-based organizations can all collaborate to improve educational outcomes. And uh, I think it's important to a lot of folks. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, I think almost everyone would agree, whether they're Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, that really a job is the best poverty program. Um, you know, having, having actually getting a job and being employable is obviously a big part of that. Uh, let me kind of change folks a little bit and talk about um, uh, vacant and foreclosed properties. I know you're involved with that as well. What do you do? What are your strategies to combat vacant and foreclosed properties? So we've really seen a decrease in vacant and foreclosed properties after the real estate recovery, but we're still seeing a, a tremendous number of properties that aren't being well maintained. And there's a lot of tension between landlords and tenants. Now we have some institutional landlords buying up thousands of units in some cities. Mm -hmm. And um, and really it takes a cross-sector, very close collaboration between banks, between the, the landlords and, and property management firms, um, uh, government entities like like the city code enforcement divisions and community development and, and police. And your concern there is your vacant and foreclosed properties obviously can hurt the economic development in that area uh, near that vacant property, right. correct? Um, what about, a little bit different, what about affordable housing on the other end of the continuum? Um, what are you doing to increase the amount of affordable housing? So uh, we do a number of workshops around some of the financing mechanisms for affordable housing, like low-income uh, tax credits and new markets tax credits, and uh, work with banks to invest as uh, through their CRA requirements. Is that as big an issue in the Valley as it is, let's say, in San Francisco and on the coast? Well, it's interesting because in the Central Valley, it's uh, known to have affordable housing, yet it's all relative because we do have this uh, very high unemployment rate uh, relative to the coast and, and, and also low wages. Mm -hmm. So, so the income and, and wages are lower, but housing prices are lower, but that, that's still not affordable. Right. Many uh, people can't afford to even rent a home, much less own one. I've only got, we've only got about 30 seconds left in the segment. I just want to ask you this one last question. Going forward in the next year, what do you see the most important programs are going to be working on? 
Well, I want to let the community drive that and, and come to me with, uh, with issues and challenges, but really looking holistically at healthy communities and how we can work together to improve. I'll read that as trails. <laughs> well, I want to thank Leilani Barnett, the Regional Manager for Community Development, the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco, for joining us. If you want to stay up to date with state and local politics, you can sign up for our free e-newsletter, The Maddie Daily, and log on to our website at maddieinstitute.org. And now, another perspective. The Federal Reserve Bank has not provided enough uh, investment into the Central Valley, especially in the rural communities. Uh, if the Federal Reserve Bank can provide more CRA funding or provide a little bit more type of projects that would sufficiently provide the work or the programs infrastructure in the Central Valley, we have way more efficiency with the funds that we do get. For example, if we can get some more into training dollars, that would be awesome. If we can get some more into the infrastructure for the smaller communities and provide affordable housing, uh, that which will then provide a better way of um, quality of life. Uh, if we can definitely do more with the little bit of money that we get, or if we can get more money to do a lot more than what we are already doing, that would be awesome. The Federal Reserve Bank has to focus in on what the needs of the communities are, especially out in the rural. There's very, very few investments out in the rural communities um, across the Central Valley. I'm talking rural, non-metropolitan areas, um, those that are unincorporated areas. So we definitely need to have more investment, and it does impact the quality of life. Um, for example, if you have a hard-working family in the, farm, in the farm industry and they're trying to buy a house, how do you consider them affordable housing if the 50% of the income is based on the uh, male working and 50% on the female working? What if one has to stop working? 50% of their income is, is therefore done. So how can they afford a house even if it's under affordable housing? So investments into projects like that would be great. Training. How do we get more monies into training these individuals so they can become a better part of the workforce? How do we get high school to continue the trades that they stopped uh, offering many, many years ago? We do need those type of trades coming out of high school. We need those, those students to come out with those uh, skills, uh, with the knowledge of going into the workplace because college, unfortunately, is not for everyone at this point in time. However, you can still get a good job coming out of high school if the trades can be brought back through in the high school, but we do need funding to get that back into place and we can get those numbers out there. This has been Victor Bibiesca for The Matter Report. The views expressed in The Matter Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the Maddie Institute, the California Channel, Casey, or Valley PBS. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions shared in The Matter Report, visit our website at valleypbs.org slash Maddie. This is Mark Kepler for the Maddie Report. Thanks for joining us.